Okay, so we can start the second part of the panel. We have our last presentation for, for uh, the morning, then the discussion will follow. And uh, our speaker he is uh, Hans Martin Kramer. Uh, he has been professor of Japanese studies uh, at the University of Heidelberg in Germany for uh, uh, two years since uh, 2012, but he also worked in the research, research in Bochum, in Kyoto, and at Harvard University. And his current area of specialization is the Japanese higher education system in the 20th century, and especially the peri in the period of um, the American occupation after World War II. And in fact, he has published a number of articles and uh, book chapters on the topics, and his first book uh, in uh, uh, 2005 is related with such problems. And in his presentation today, um, uh, well, the, the title and the topic has slightly changed after the preparation of the problem, and uh, in fact, Hans Martin Kramer will focus on uh, continuities and discontinuities in financing and governance of Japanese higher education system before and after World War II. And so, please. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this conference, and thank you also for putting me into the first panel. Usually, as a Japan specialist, what happens when I'm invited to interdisciplinary conferences is that I listen to papers in Europe for two or three days, and then at the very end, when almost everybody has already returned home, they put me into a rest of the world panel and I get to present on Japan. So it's quite unusual to have Argentina and Japan at the very beginning. I guess that's due to the reverse order. We're going three, two, one, right? And then uh, take off tomorrow, I guess. So yes, I changed the title of my paper slightly. Um, let me take you to Japan. Um, to start this off. The time is 1945, August 15th. At noon, the Japanese emperor, in a specially announced radio broadcast, declared the surrender of the Japanese empire to the Allied forces and thus the end of World War II. Just a few hours later, on the very same day, Hiraizumi Kiyoshi, professor of Japanese history at the Imperial University of Tokyo and the most prominent representative of the ultranationalist so-called imperial view of history school in Japan, went to his university's central administration, human resource department, to hand in his resignation. He was certain that he would have to face a trial or a purge by the uh, victorious allies. And indeed, a purge of higher education personnel involved in the wartime effort was to be ordered in early 1946. And Hiraizumi, um, just to be sure, although he already had resigned, was in fact barred from holding public offices in 1948 until the end of the occupation. And the reason that uh, he is uh, photographed here in the garb of a Shinto priest is because that's uh, the new occupation he took up, in fact, in 1946. After leaving Tokyo Imperial University, he went to become a shrine priest. So anyway, the occupation authorities did not stop at removing undesirable personnel, a topic that's probably more fit for panel one tomorrow, and uh, reinstating professors who had been dismissed prior to 1945. Rather, the entire system of higher education was fundamentally overhauled between 1945 and 1952, the duration of the Allied occupation of Japan. And this drastic overhaul focused around the following reform areas the full admission of women into universities, the elevation of teachers' education to a university level, abolishing a multi-track system in higher education that distinguished sharply between universities and lower colleges, technical colleges, and unifying the preparatory education, secondary education um, entry into universities. For the occupation bureaucracy, the rationale behind these reforms was the democratization of the overall education system. From the pre-war maze of tracks, partially open only to members of certain classes or only to males, the US Americans proposed switching over to a much simplified 6334 system, that is six years elementary school, three years middle school, three years higher school, and four years of higher education. So in the case of higher education, the more narrowly defined goal was to democratize the access to the highest pinnacle of the education system, 
In the words of one of the protagonists in the civil information and education section, that part of the occupation bureaucracy responsible for education, the goals were formulated as follows, quote, Japanese higher education was indeed in need of reform. This is written in 1952 in hindsight. The complex and discriminatory structure of schools which had operated at the secondary level in the preoccupation years found its fruition in higher education. Throughout the whole scene, the multi-channel system of education operated with the benefits of the better higher education available only to the few who had followed the favorite channels of education. Now, as to the outcome of this structural reform, using a very rough measure, one could say that the democratization of Japanese higher education was very successful. Immediately after the new system came into effect in 1947, 1948, the proportion of 20 to 24-year-olds attending higher education began to rise from about 5% in the late 1940s to over 10% in 1965. As much as the superficial system of higher education looked radically made over, however, the deeper structures may be argued to have remained unchanged. This concerns particularly governance, and finances. So today I want to show how these deeper structures persisted in the field of governance and finances of higher education throughout and beyond the occupation period. I will trace how this came to be about within the peculiar power dynamics of the occupation and I will also try to offer an explanation why these structures could persist. But first, since I imagine that few of you know anything about Japanese higher education, let me give you an overview over the modern history of higher education in Japan as um, some background information. The first modern university was founded in Japan in 1877, Tokyo Imperial University. In the first few decades of the existence of a modern education system, the Japanese state indeed reserved the label university, daigaku, for only a very small number of state-run institutions. And you see all of them that were actually called universities in the narrow sense until 1918. And you see the state established uh, univers imperial universities um, geographically, strategically in geographic parts of all of Japan. Mm, only in 1919 did the state allow some other institutions to formally call themselves university, namely some state schools for medicine, commerce, and engineering, so-called single-subject universities, and around 20 private universities. Now, none of these um, new universities in 1919 were newly established institutions at that time. Instead, they had been part of the higher education sector albeit as different entities, namely colleges, uh, which is the usual English translation, um, semmon gakko in Japanese, literally special subject schools. Dozens of these existed uh, in the private sector, even after some of their peers had been elevated to university status in, 19, in the 1920s. A third pillar of the pre-war higher education system were the teacher training schools. By the early 1940s, there were two in each of the 47 prefectures in Japan, one for males, one for females. Now, you may begin to wonder, um, wh where do all these, these dozens and dozens of higher education institutes come from? Who, who do they cater to? So it might be good to remind you that Japan's population around 1940 was 80 million, uh, much higher than any European country at the time. Uh, Germany, first with 68 million. Italy had about 47 million at that time. So we're talking about quite a substantial market for education here. And uh, finally, the fourth pillar of the higher education system, pre-war as I define it, were what were called higher schools, not to be confused with today's uh, higher schools in Japan, which were at that time preparatory institutes for the universities in the narrow sense, so elite institutes. So in other words, the higher school of that time was more like a college education in the American, contemporary American sense, perhaps, preparing for universities that would then have felt more like a graduate school in today's parlance. So to give you a quantitative overview, and these are just the central state institutions, the institutions that the central state set up and ran. In, uh, this is, these are figures for 1943. There were seven imperial universities. There were 10 single subject universities for engineering, um, medicine, or commerce. There were 58 technical 
colleges, 26 higher schools, and 55 normal schools, um, these being uh, already the amalgamated uh, women and men uh, counted together. Um, as I said, these figures are only for the central state schools. There were about 30 private universities at the same time and 180 private colleges already as well, all these being defined as in the higher education sector. Now, returning to the narrative that I started earlier about the, the, the makeover of this, the change after 1945, these 156 state institutions I've listed here were consolidated into 72 new, so-called new system universities in 1947-48 during the occupation. And basically, these are the central state institutions still in existence today. Today, there are 86 um, central state universities in Japan, quite little changed since then. In contrast, and just to give you a uh, sort of vague sense of what would happen after 45 uh, to the present, the private sector has exploded over the post-war period. There are almost 700 private universities in existence today in Japan in a country of 127 million inhabitants, quite fierce competition in the higher education sector. And although many of these private schools are very small, 80% of all students today in Japan study at private universities um, versus 20 at state, state public universities, a figure that was around 50% in mid 20th century Japan. So quite a fundamental change there. Um, so just um, to give you a sort of uh, structural overview and diagram form that perhaps helps you understand better what, what I'm talking about. This is the pre-war Japanese school system. Um, and what, what you see here is uh, several things. You see there are uh, separated tracks for women and men. That's very important. Um, basically, after elementary school, um, if you are a, a girl or a woman, you cannot go to middle school and on to high school and university, but you can only go to a so-called higher girls school, which would then uh, only lead you um, the, uh, leave the path to a women's college for you. And that, that's it. There's no other way. Um, to, to advance through the system. Um, and also, um, there are uh, several tracks within um, uh, the, the male uh, sort of standard education. You see that after elementary school, you could either go on to a so-called higher elementary school two more years, but if you did that, you were basically in a cul-de-sac. You could not advance further, uh, but you'd have to have chosen the middle school uh, track earlier in order to advance further uh, on the way up. Um, you can also see uh, the figures here are um, numbers per, per one, one class, one year of students. Uh, and now if we compare to the post-war system that was then created in 1946, in the following years you see it's a, it's a fairly uh, straightforward one-track system. Elementary school, middle school, higher school, there, there are no parallel systems here at all. It's certainly uh, completely gender unified. And then the main distinction above that is that you have uh, beyond the, the uh, new system university that um, was created out of all the pre-war higher education institutes, the, the various that I've just mentioned, you have an alternative in form of the so-called short-term university, Tanki Daigaku, which is only two years, and which then happened to uh, cater mainly to women, um, very important throughout the post-war period, uh, just about to lose its, lose its significance in the, in the last few years um, now. So this is the overview. Now let's return to the issue at hand, what happened during the occupation, and let's move to governance beyond the simple out, out, uh, outward structures that I've talked about so far. In fact, um, beyond just the structures of higher education, reforming higher education governing structures was also a high priority of the US-led occupation. Um, and this you can find uh, expressed again by the same civil information and education section, uh, US occupation bureaucrat that I have already quoted above. Again, in 1952, he, he writes, it is not strange then that the American educators in evaluating the education system of Japan as it existed prior to the end of the war should consider that a major requirement for its reform um, were, was the reorganization, was some formula by means of which the power to administratively control the schools should be shifted from its highly central location in the Ministry of Education and the national government to some agency or agencies closer to the people themselves. So let's take a look at what the governance actually looked like uh, before 1945. Mm -hmm. 
what you basically have is you have a mixture of a very strong central state um, um, administrative control over institutions and at the imperial universities, but only at those, you also have a fairly strong uh, say of the professors um, organized in the faculty conferences and the university senate. These two bodies only existed in the seven imperial universities, I have to say. Um, so the, there was some degree of autonomy in terms of um, right to elect uh, their own president, again, only at the imperial universities, certainly on matters related to teaching and appointment of academic staff. Um, in contrast, the Minister of Education uh, was uh, responsible for overall matters like establishing new universities, but also uh, for budgetary matters to a uh, quite detailed degree. So the Minister of Education um, set the number of students each school and faculty could enroll, even at the imperial universities. It set the tuition fees and examination fees for each school. The budgets for each individual school were drawn up in the Ministry of Education. And every expenditure, every major expenditure, needed the explicit approval of the Ministry of Education. So there was indeed, as the um, US bureaucrat uh, just quoted said, there was a quite a high degree of uh, central control. Um, now, what the US uh, bureaucrats in the uh, uh, occupation did was they drafted a, a law, an outline of proposed law governing universities in 1948. Um, this is basically after all the more important uh, structural changes, uh, reforms have already been performed, especially in the lower um, elementary, middle education, secondary, up, up to secondary education. And the proposal in this bill is essentially to provide for boards of control after the model of US American public universities. Um, more concretely, administrative tasks um, hitherto uh, shouldered either by the universities themselves or the Minister of Education were now distributed were now to be distributed among four partially new institutions, a national advisory board uh, at, the, at the national level the and the Minister of Education for all of Japan and a governing board a, uh, and the faculty conference at each university. Now, um, as you will immediately see, the main prerogatives are in this, in this proposed law uh, are moved to the governing board. Um, which gets to appoint academic staff, obviously a uh, central prerogative. It gets to elect the new university president uh, and even has oversight over budgetary matters. And basically the Minister of Education's role is, re uh, is reduced to the establishment of new universities uh, in the overall picture. Um, now, for the representatives of the Japanese universities, the gist of the matter lay not only in the, in the new powers to be executed by this new governing board, but especially in its composition. So the composition, again, according to this proposed law, um, was that um, it was uh, to be composed of 13 members, and you can see here, uh, don't have to read it for you, but the important point is all those marked in red were not allowed to be university employees, but had to be outsiders to the university. So basically out of 13 members, only four could be representatives of the university to be governed by these boards. Now this led to a fierce opposition by virtually everyone on the Japanese side. The Ministry of Education uh, for obvious reasons, uh, opposed this law. University presidents, um, professors association, even the students, they all rallied against this uh, proposed law. And indeed, at all types of institutions from former imperial universities to former technical colleges, basically everybody was against this proposal. So with no support at all from the Japanese side to latch onto, no degree of force could make this endeavor a success. Um, the Americans uh, had to give in, and finally the proposal was shelved, um, despite some negotiations back and forth. Uh, nothing ever happened in terms of reforming governance. Now, I have briefly mentioned the locus of budgetary power as one problem in this uh, in this attempted governance reform. Now let us look at how the state distributed money in the public higher education sector, and I think there we can find another uh, strong continuity 
slightly below the surface of the deep structural changes we see elsewhere. Um, if we carefully compare the 72 new, newly created state universities with their respective predecessor institutions, they were all created out of uh, already existing institutions, we can see that the internal hierarchy of these institutions uh, in terms of a fi financial ranking remains largely unchanged between the wartime and post-war periods. And so I have um, drawn up this table, which I hope you can read. Um, those sitting in the front should be able to read it at least. Too small, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I can tell you what, what you should be able to see. <laughs> um, Basically, what you see is, as I said, a financial ranking of the, the um, 72 new universities. The, um, if you look at the column 1958, you see that it goes down from 1 to 20. Um, and you can see the, the, the rank and the share of national uh, higher education subsidies that the respective institution gets. You see that the University of Tokyo uh, in rank 1 actually received more than 12% of, of all the money available to 72 uh, institutions in 1958. And when you then look left, you see what the rank of that institution was in 1950 and then in 1941, the earliest year for which I have this precise uh, detailed financial information. And uh, again, in 1941, these, is, these are all the predecessor institutions that were then sort of swallowed up by the new university in, in, in the post-war period. And what you see is that there's really very little change. Um, and importantly, this, this hierarchy in, in financial terms is very closely mirrored in prestige and renown. Basically, any, any Japanese could basically tell you sort of the top 10. Uh, um, it, there's really a strong consciousness of this, this kind of hierarchy. So at the top, basically, we find the seven imperial universities, or the former imperial universities, almost exactly in the order in which they were, they were founded, in fact. So it's Tokyo at the top, Kyoto second, Tohoku third, and so on. Um, universities which, after 1945, were newly created by including former medical universities make up most of the following slots in the top 20 ranking next to some technical universities and um, a few focusing on commerce. And if you look again at the 1958 list, you see that only four out of the well, richest institutions then had not already been among the top 20 in 1941. And the first five slots were occupied by the same five universities in all three years. So again, there's really hardly a little change. Uh, you'll have to believe me if you can read it. Um, and just for completeness sake, I have also uh, looked up the figures for 2010, and again, you find very, very little change. Um, basically, to display the top 20 slots in all those four years, I only need 24 lines. So you can see there are only 24 institutions that compete, basically, for these top 20 slots. Uh, quite stable system of internal hierarchy. And also, in the very last line at the bottom, you can see that the, those top 20 um, universities make up for about two-thirds of the whole national budget. So basically, the, the following 50-plus universities get, get only uh, a third of the share of money. Um, very strong hierarchy here. So for some brief concluding words, both the resilience to changes in governance and the unchanged hierarchy in terms of distribution of budget to institutions point uh, first to a limit to the powers of the US occupation. They certainly wanted to change uh, the governance system, but they simply couldn't without any support from the Japanese side. They also, uh, the resilience and the, the continuity, also hint at values and ideals of higher education that the relevant Japanese actors professors, administrators, students, politicians, associated with their system of higher education. These values and ideals concerning the accountability of public higher education and the historically grown institutional makeup and internal hierarchy differed from those held by the US reformers. There was thus in the meeting of US occupationaires and occupied Japanese, despite broad agreements on structural changes, a fundamental cleavage in broader ideals of higher education. Japanese administrators and practitioners of higher education perceived their institutional system as a national one, to be governed by a national center 
with a clear national hierarchy and with the aim of producing a national elite. They did not want to diffuse this down to a local level and have local representatives on governing boards running the national universities. Despite the rhetoric of democratization after 1945, the hierarchical elements and inequality thus remained built into the system and they are still basically at work today. Thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you. We all thank Hans Martin Kramer for this other fascinating presentation.